Every now and then, a result appears that forces you to return to a topic you thought you'd already explored. And that's what's happened here. The quasar dipole was strange enough. Motion that refused to match the cosmic microwave background. Hinting that our movement through the universe might not be what we think it is. Many people dismissed it. It's a quasar. They said messy, biased, can't take it seriously. Fair enough for quasars. But now, a brand new study has arrived and this one does not use quasars at all. It uses radio galaxies, cleaner data, multiple independent surveys, far fewer escape routes. And the results break something cosmology treats as sacred. The direction of this dipole lines up almost perfectly with the CMB, exactly as the standard model says it should. But the speed does not, not even close. According to this measurement, our true velocity would need to be almost four times faster. And if that's true, then the CMB dipole, the feature we treat as the universe's rest frame, is no longer telling us the truth about our motion. So let's look at what this new study actually found and why the consequences reach far beyond a single number. To understand why this creates such a big problem for Lambda CDM, we need to be clear about what the CMB dipole is supposed to represent inside the standard model. The idea begins with the CMB itself. In Lambda CDM, this ancient light isn't just a relic. It acts as a universal backdrop, a kind of cosmic reference field. The tiny temperature difference we see across the sky, the dipole, is assumed to come entirely from our motion through the field. So when you measure the dipole, you're meant to be measuring our true velocity through the universe. Planck puts that at about 369 kilometers per second, and that value becomes the anchor point for everything else. But that interpretation only works because of another idea that the model takes for granted. The assumption that, on the larger scales, the universe is statistically isotropic. And by isotropic, cosmologists don't just mean it looks the same everywhere. They mean that if you zoom out far enough, the distribution of matter shouldn't have any preferred direction. No enormous density gradients, no giant flows, no special patches of sky where galaxies behave differently. And because of that assumed isotropy, the random motions of individual galaxies, their little peculiar motions, should average out when you look at millions of them spread across the sky. What remains should be the same global motion we see in the CMB. In that picture, any dipole in the galaxy count must come from our motion, not from real structures in the universe. When you put those ideas together, the prediction is very clear. If the CMB dipole tells us how fast we're moving, and if matter on the larger scale has no preferred direction, then every large scale matter survey should show the same dipole. Same direction, same magnitude. That's the expectation. That's the foundation that the model is built on. And this is exactly where the new radio results break away. The direction lines up almost perfectly. The speed does not. Now, before we look at what the new study found, it helps to understand why radio surveys have always disagreed with one another. Because that inconsistency is a big part of the story. It's the reason that cosmologists kept assuming the matter dipole would eventually fall into line with the CMB once the data improved. The problem is that the radio surveys are more complicated than they look. When you detect a radio galaxy, you aren't always seeing a single clean point of emission. Many radio galaxies have jets, lobes and hotspots, and depending on the resolution of the telescope, they can show up as separate blobs on the sky. So instead of listing one galaxy, the catalogue might accidentally list two or three pieces of the same object. Now, for decades, the standard method for extracting a dipole from radio surveys relied on a simple idea. Count the number of sources across the sky and look for a slight excess in one direction. The whole method assumed every source was independent. One object, one count, one data point. And if that were true, the old approach would have been perfectly fine. It was simple, clean, and completely reasonable at the time. In fact, for many kinds of surveys, it is the right method. But radio galaxies break that assumption, because one galaxy can generate multiple components. The sky isn't filled with independent points anymore. Some regions look artificially busier simply because the telescope split a single galaxy into several parts. That inflates the natural variation in the data. The sky looks noisier than the old method expected it to be. And here's the important part. 
the old method had no way of accounting for that extra noise. It treated all those components as if they were separate galaxies, even though they weren't. This is why different radio surveys never agreed. They were all using a method that underestimated how messy the data really was. The new study fixes this. Instead of pretending that every dot on the sky is its own galaxy, it uses a more realistic method, one that treats each radio source as a little cluster of possible components. That means the expected variations in the data are larger, and the uncertainties are wider, but now they actually match how radio galaxies behave in real life. What changes isn't the dipoles themselves, it's our ability to see the ones that are real. Once you use the correct noise model, only two surveys remain stable enough to trust, and when you combine just those, the dipole snaps into focus, pointing in the same direction as the CMB, but with nearly four times the speed. This is why the new results matter so much. It isn't just repeating the old radio anomalies, it fixes the methodology that made those anomalies unreliable in the first place. It cleans up the statistics, resolves the long-standing disagreements between surveys, and leaves behind a dipole that is cleaner, stronger, and far harder to explain away. If the story ended there, cosmologists would be celebrating. The direction matches the CMB exactly as the models predicted. But the other half of the results, the magnitude, doesn't just disagree, it blows the prediction apart. The velocity we get from the CMD gives us a very specific dipole strength. But the dipole measured in the new radio analysis isn't a little bit higher than that. It isn't even double, it's 3.67 times larger. And the size of the mismatch is not the kind of thing that could be explained away by calibration error or a few odd data points. It's not a borderline anomaly, it's a result that sits far outside what random variation can produce. In practical terms, it tells us that the radio dipole is not a noisy version of the CMB dipole, it's something else. A completely different answer to the question, how fast are we moving through the universe? And if the radio dipole is tracing our true motion, then we aren't moving at 369 km per second, we're moving closer to 1400 km per second. And that is fundamentally incompatible with a universe that is supposed to have one rest frame. For cosmologists, this is the equivalent of a mini apocalypse. The moment when your trusted map suddenly doesn't match the terrain. And when that happens, you have two choices. Pretend nothing is wrong or get prepared. Personally, I've always had this habit of trying to think ahead, imagining how I would cope if everything around me suddenly changed. Maybe it comes from growing up in the late 70s and early 80s, when the idea of a nuclear holocaust, well, it wasn't front page news, but it was still in the air. Back then, I used to picture what it would be like to build and live in huge domed cities under the ocean, hidden away from whatever catastrophe unfolded on the surface. Not because I wanted the world to end, just because the planning itself was strangely fascinating. So, when I came across the four book, it immediately pulled me in. It takes four completely different apocalyptic scenarios and treats each one like its own self-contained world. And instead of giving you a dry checklist, it explores the kinds of questions people actually think about. What would I do? What would it really look like? And how on earth would you survive that? Each chapter has its own writer and its own art style, so it feels like you're hopping between four alternate timelines. Funny in places, dark in others and surprisingly thoughtful throughout. It's the kind of book that sticks with you, not just because of the survival ideas, but because of the creativity behind it. It's also a great conversation starter, the sort of thing you'd show a friend over coffee or a beer, and suddenly you're both arguing about which scenario you'd stand the best chance in. If this sounds like something you'd enjoy exploring, there's a link in the description where you can check it out. Use the promo code, get a 20% discount. All right. Back to the cosmic version of the apocalypse. Once you take the radio results seriously, the deeper issue isn't the number itself, it's everything the number touches. Because if matter on the larger scales implies a much higher velocity than the CMB, the contradiction isn't in the data, it's in the interpretation. Lambda CDM expects every large scale probe to converge on the same rest frame. The CMB defines the baseline. Matter should trace it. The shared reference frame is not a decorative detail, it's one of the quiet load-bearing beams of the entire structure. So when a correct, 
cross-validated, multi-survey matter dipole refuses to converge on the CMB velocity, it means something in that foundational link between early time radiation and late time structure is misbehaving. This is why the result is so hard to ignore. The direction matches the CMB, the magnitude breaks the model. And once you accept the measurement is clean, the contradiction becomes brutally simple. Two independent ways of measuring our motion now give incompatible answers. And inside Lambda CDM, that leaves only a few possibilities. The first, the matter distribution is doing something unexpected on enormous scales. The second, the CMB isn't tracing the cosmic rest frame as cleanly as assumed. And lastly, the connection between early and late universe physics is incomplete. None of these options sit comfortably inside Lambda CDM. And that's the point. The tension isn't local, it's conceptual, and it strikes at the model's assumptions, not its data sets. Now, when you line up all the independent attempts to measure our motion through the universe, what stands out is not the noise, it's the consistency of the disagreement. The quasar count dipoles were the first major warning sign. They didn't agree with the CMB value. Some pointed slightly off the CMB direction, others were closer, but all of them showed the same underlying problem. The amplitude was too large. Not a little too large, several times larger than expected. Now, this new radio analysis removes the methodological issues that we use to dismiss early results. And it converges on the same theme. The direction lines up with the CMB almost perfectly, but the implied speed is almost four times higher. It's a cleaner, more robust version of the same tension. Then there are the redshift-based dipoles, such as the ones extracted by signal that we covered in the other video. These don't use sky counts at all, they look at asymmetries in redshift distributions. And they give a completely different answer again, a much larger velocity and a direction almost 90 degrees away from the CMB dipole. You don't have to accept those results outright to notice the pattern they hint at. And beyond dipoles, we have large-scale bulk flow measurements, not dipoles themselves, but independent evidence that the matter in our region of the universe might be moving more coherently and more rapidly than Lambda CDM predicts. Different methods, different tracers, different wavelengths, but all pointing towards the same tension. The large scale motion of matter in the universe does not appear to align neatly with the motion inferred from the CMB. And every time we try and measure it in a new way, the disagreement either persists or gets sharper. That's the pattern, not a single anomaly, but a family of them, all pulling on the same thread. What that thread leads to isn't another isolated anomaly, but a deeper question about the framework itself. Because once you pull in it long enough, you stop wondering why individual measurements disagree, and you start wondering what all of them are disagreeing with. The tension isn't pointing to a flaw in the catalogue or survey, it's pointing straight to the assumptions we use to interpret the entire universe. And that's where this new radio result becomes more than a curiosity. It forces us to look at the foundations of the model, how we define motion, how we define a rest frame, and what we think redshift is actually measuring. These ideas sit so deeply in cosmology that they're rarely examined. We simply accept them because everything else depends on them. But when independent observations tug on the same assumption from different directions, you can no longer treat those assumptions as untouchable something fundamental is being exposed. Because if matter on the larger scales is not tracing the motion inferred from the C and B, then the link between the early time radiation and late time structure, one of the pillars of Lambda CDM, isn't behaving the way the model claims it should. And if the matter dipole, the quasar dipole, and other traces all keep drifting away from the C and B's answer, the natural question becomes, what exactly is Redshift telling us? Is it only measuring motion or expansion or is there more embedded in it than we've allowed for? That's the doorway the result opens, and this is where the tone shifts. Because once you see these contradictions all press on the same structural assumption, the problem stops being dipoles. It becomes a sign that the Lambda CDM framework itself is straining, not because the universe is misbehaving, but because the model can no longer hold everything the universe is trying to tell us. We've seen this with the timelines that collapse under JWST, with early galaxies that shouldn't exist, with large-scale structures that shouldn't form, and now with dipole measurements that the model cannot reconcile. Piece by piece, the evidence is pushing against the bars of a framework 
that was never built to explain all of this. Lambda CDM can stretch around anomalies for a while by adding dark components or inventing early phases or introducing new calibrations. But every stretch makes the model less predictive and more self-referential. Eventually, the scaffolding starts to bow. And that's what makes this radio dipole result so important. It isn't just another inconsistency. It's another point of pressure on the same weak joint. The way we interpret motion, distance and redshift itself. It tells us the universe isn't lining up with the story the model demands. And the assumption of a single, simple rest frame may be the very thing that's breaking. We don't yet know what replaces that assumption. But we can see more clearly than ever that the universe we're observing is no longer the universe described by Lambda CDM. The universe isn't failing to fit the model, the model is failing to describe the universe. And that's the point at which real progress begins.